Sure. Well, fossil fuel subsidies are incredibly important. They, they are tremendous expenditures by governments around the world. We've put figures bordering on $1 trillion per year in subsidizing fossil fuels. Um, some of that goes towards consumption of fossil fuels in developing countries in particular. Uh, it's helping to reduce the cost of gas and, and other fossil fuels. But in rich countries, it's actually going straight to producers of fossil fuels. So straight to the largest oil companies and coal companies and gas companies in the world to produce these fuels. Meanwhile, the International Energy Agency just recently put out a report that said we need to keep two thirds of the known fossil fuels in the ground in order to uh, keep global warming below two degrees. So on the one hand, we're subsidizing fossil fuel use, and on the other hand, we actually need to keep it in the ground. Which, from a layman's, layperson's point of view, obviously makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. I mean, surely I think the first question many people would ask is surely the, the oil companies, the gas companies, make a big enough profit anyway without being subsidized by governments. So, so how, did all this, how did this come about? Very briefly, how did yeah. this come about? So we've been really focused on production subsidies, subsidies to these producers uh, in the richest countries. And they take the form of tax breaks, tax loopholes, uh, exemptions from environmental laws. And part of the reason that they come about is because the oil industry, the coal industry, the fossil fuel industries in these rich countries have tremendous amounts of money to lobby the government, to uh, com contribute to campaigns, and, and otherwise influence the political process. So they get these loopholes into place. And, and they stay in place for a long time because of inertia and politics and otherwise. So we're really working hard to try to close those loopholes to try to make sure that there's an even playing field, playing field for renewables to actually come online, especially in the, in the case uh, now where we know that we have way too much fossil fuels to even burn. I mean, presumably the energy companies put up all sorts of obstacles when you talk about closing those loopholes. But when yeah. you point out the fundamentally obvious to governments, Generally, what kind of response uh, do you get? Well, in, in the rich countries and developed countries, uh, it's pretty clear that, you know, in the context of budget negotiations in the U.S., we're facing this so-called fiscal cliff. This is a clear place where you can actually raise some revenue and you can actually reduce spending from the government. So they're interested in it, but, um, you know, we have to fight against some of the, the largest lobbyists in the world. And, and it's, a, it's a hard battle, uh, but we think that uh, the argument is quite clear. And what can be done here in Doha and, and in negotiations beyond Doha to try to close those loopholes to get yeah. to the negotiating process here on your side? Sure. Well, in 2009, the G20 agreed to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies in the medium term. And since then, they actually haven't done a whole lot to actually uh, live up to that commitment. So we're hoping to see here in Doha a, a sort of reiteration of that commitment, but actually going further and saying, in the pre-2020 uh, mitigation ambition, in the, in the track where they're talking about how they can raise ambition in the short term to reduce emissions, that fossil fuel subsidy elimination can be on that list. Uh, we want to see in the Durban platform negotiations, countries talk about fossil fuel subsidy reform as a way of increasing their ambition for emission reductions. Uh, the IEA says that if we actually eliminate fossil fuel subsidies globally, we can actually achieve almost half of the additional emission reductions that are required to close the gap by 2020 to actually meet what the science says is needed to stay below 2 degrees Celsius.